The George Washington Bridge between Manhattan and New Jersey is the world's busiest motor vehicle crossing, carrying more than 103 million vehicles a year over the Hudson River. That means that hundreds of thousands of people every day depend on the GWB as a critical connection to work, commerce, culture, and home. And so in 2013, when accusations came out that hand-picked members of former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's staff deliberately caused massive traffic backups on and around the bridge, there was a bit of a scandal. Governor Chris Christie's administration said it is all part of a traffic study. It was believed someone within the administration was trying to punish a Democratic New Jersey mayor. But for Anthony Hayes, the Bridgegate scandal was more than a flashy cable news headline. As the Assistant Director of Communications and Media at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, it was his job to manage the public relations fallout. When there's something that's this big of a political crisis that involves, you know, two governors, multiple bodies of people investigating you, subpoenas, etc., our team was just managing so much complexity and Bridgegate was a piece of it. Anthony's tale is a telling tutorial in managing the reputation of a public institution damaged by private petty partisanship, and his behind-the-scenes insights shed new light on a scandal that many say ended Chris Christie's 2016 presidential campaign before it really even ever had a chance to get off the ground. I'm Dusty Weiss from Podcamp Media. This is Lead Balloon, a podcast about PR, marketing, and branding disasters and the well-meaning communications professionals who lived them. Thanks for tuning in. Check out Podcamp Media on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you're at Podcast Movement this week, the world's largest podcasting conference, come and find me. I'm speaking in a panel discussion on Thursday about podcasts for brands, and I would love to make your acquaintance. We're joined now by Anthony Hayes, founder of the Hayes Initiative, a public affairs and strategic communications firm in New York. Anthony's last stop before striking out on his own was to serve on the advance team for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, specializing in crisis management, an experience that I can only imagine took years off of his life. He previously served as VP of Public Affairs for GMHC, overseeing communications and marketing in their battle against the AIDS epidemic. And from 2011 to 2014, he was the Assistant Director of Communications and Media at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. That is where our story begins today. So, Anthony Hayes, thank you for joining us on Lead Balloon. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. You know, it's funny because the story of the Bridgegate scandal broke almost eight years ago. And this was a major news story in 2013. It basically ended the presidential ambitions of then New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. And in a lot of ways, it is only now just winding down from the news cycle. But also, when you compare it against the political scandals of the latter 20 teens, it seems quaint in comparison. Yes, it does. You were appointed in 2011 to fill the role of Assistant Director of Communications and Media at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Appointed by whom and how did you land in that job? Yeah, so I had been working on, I worked for the Human Rights Campaign and met Bill Baroni at the time, a uh, senator in New Jersey, who then came over and was the deputy executive director appointed by Chris Christie at the port. And they actually brought me in initially as a consultant to help with the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And in that time there, you know, I was also having conversations about possibly joining, unrelated to my work at the Port Authority, joining the Cuomo administration in New York. So it just so happens that after about two weeks in, was offered a permanent job there, which was, again, the Assistant Director of Media and Communications. It oddly put me right in the middle of sort of the two governors that were in the tri-state area. So I was having conversations about joining the administration of one, and then another just happened to be running the agency where I ended up working. So I ended up working for both of those governors. You hint a little bit there about one of the most interesting things about the Port Authority to me, which is, okay, people hear Port Authority and they think they've got boats and they've got docks, but you mentioned 9-11 and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey really oversees so much more than its name would connote. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a giant agency here in New York that really has some of the most precious infrastructure assets really in the country. And it includes, you know, multiple crossings across the Hudson, whether that's the George Washington Bridge, various tunnels. You certainly mentioned the ports and the boats, but the Port Authority also owned the 16 acre World Trade Center site which obviously took over and really sort of helped in a major way, really rebuilding the World Trade Center site, which was a big part of my portfolio as well while I was there. But they also have the bus terminal. They have their own police department. You know, they are run by two governors. They have all the airports, LaGuardia, JFK, Newark. And, you know, it it has about a $7 billion a year budget, which is larger than some states' budgets. So it's a huge, huge agency that's in charge of really, really important infrastructure here in the tri-state area. Anyone who's ever worked in communications for a government agency will tell you that it's a complex environment in which to work. But as a shared venture between New York and New Jersey, the Port Authority is particularly nuanced. And in 2013, it was that complexity that contributed to a situation in which shenanigans were able to percolate. Here's how it worked. Anytime you've got two massive units of government working together on a thing, you got to have some sort of power sharing agreement, right? After all, both states are contributing money that makes up the budget, so it's got to serve everyone's interests. And in the case of the Port Authority, those interests were represented by Democratic New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and Republican New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. The Port Authority is run by an executive director and a deputy who take their orders from a board of commissioners, which is overseen by a chair and a vice chair. And to share the power and bridge that wide gulf of partisan interests, the agreement was this. New York's governor gets to appoint the executive director and the vice chair. New Jersey's governor gets to appoint the chair and the deputy executive director. And while that agreement worked pretty well for many, many years, the effective result is this. Thousands of nonpartisan public servants, Port Authority employees, who take their orders from two different, very powerful, very cloistered sets of partisan appointees that aren't necessarily working toward the same goals or even talking to each other all that much. So on Monday, September 9th, the first day of school in 2013, nonpartisan employees on the George Washington Bridge were given an order that they had no reason to question, cut the number of lanes entering the bridge from the New Jersey city of Fort Lee from three to just one. The resulting traffic backup tied up Fort Lee commuters in hours of gridlock, and traffic backup spilled from the bridge itself throughout the entire city, delaying school buses and even emergency services vehicles. It was a mess, though no one knew why yet. Not even Anthony Hayes in the Port Authority Communications Office. You know, we would send out clips to senior leadership I think three times a day, if I'm not mistaken. So in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. And in one of the evening, these were the clips that took place and these were other sort of pending requests, those kinds of notifications that communication offices send out to people. There was something in there about an inquiry from, you know, the Bergen record, if memory serves. And I didn't think much about it, to be perfectly honest, because I just thought the reporter was really confused because anytime the port does any sort of really lane closure, changes to traffic flow, shutting something down, you know, our office is really a part of notifying people, press releases, media advisories, tweeting, all of those things. And certainly one of the worst feelings that you can have as a professional communicator for a government body, speaking from experience here, is the realization that you have been put on an island by the bureaucrats or the elected officials who are making the decisions. That even though it's your job to communicate to the public about pressing matters of health and safety, that people higher up the chain of command They can take actions without informing you and leave you as much in the dark as the press and the public. How did you realize that this was what had happened to you here? And what were you feeling when you realized that? Yeah, I think there's important context that the Port Authority has about 7,000 employees. If the numbers may have waned since I was there, but approximately 7,000, it's thousands of employees. And so... I don't know that at that point, again, when I read that inquiry or sort of even as things went on, I think there was just a lot of like, somewhere there's been a miscommunication. 
no one really sort of thought what was being put out into the universe was possible because out of all those thousands of people, there's some really incredible dedicated employees who they've spent their whole careers at this agency making things like the George Washington Bridge, LaGuardia, JFK, say what you want about them, you know, as a member of the public, but like, nonetheless, the, the Port Authority engages with millions and millions of people commuting a day and does so successfully. So like, it's not the way the port works. And so I just sort of feel like a lot of the people who sort of were aware of this, which was a smaller number of those people, we all just thought there was just a miscommunication and it's going to work itself out. But at an agency that big, you also have to understand like a miscommunication like that or a bump in the road, so to speak. That's just par for the course. At that time, at that level, what, what we're talking about, that media inquiry that I was reading, you know, at any given time, we had 12 complicated pending media requests that, you know, we were fighting through and figuring out and clarifying. So, you know, sometimes reporters reach out and they have an idea of what's happening, but they have no idea. And then when we sort of sit as communicators, lay it out for them put everything in context, you know, share documents if that's required, then all of a sudden they realize, oh gosh, we really had this story wrong. So a lot of times there was a number of stories about the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey that no one ever saw just because the reporters were getting bad information and we sort of gave them and proved it, right? Like they didn't just take our word for it, right? We had to prove it and rightly so. So, but yeah, it was one of many on that particular day where I was like, huh, eh, that'll get figured out. Somebody is going to figure out what's going on here and then we'll get it set right and everything will be communicated. And certainly it didn't strike you in the moment that this was actually a case of political mischief, people that Governor Chris Christie had appointed to office and they're running around making lives difficult for these residents in a city in New Jersey on purpose. Yeah, no one, no one, no one thought that of the people who read that email that I'm talking about. It just wasn't something that people thought because it just, it's not the way we work. But remember, the way we work for the vast majority of nonpartisan employees at the Port Authority is a separate culture from the highly partisan leadership silos. And as the week went on, the lane closures continued on the Fort Lee on-ramp. Fort Lee, by the way, the home of Democratic Mayor Mark Sokolich, who, it would later come up, had rebuffed Republican Governor Chris Christie's previous request for a campaign endorsement. Fort Lee continued to suffer from punishing gridlock throughout the city. On at least one occasion, paramedics in a traffic-snarled ambulance are reported to have abandoned the vehicle to respond to emergency calls on foot. The problems lasted through Friday of that week when Port Authority Executive Director Patrick Foy, remember he's from the New York leadership silo appointed by Governor Andrew Cuomo, Patrick Foy sent out an email contravening the orders to close the bridge lanes, calling the decision to close the lanes hasty and ill-advised. He added that the closure violated policy and long-standing custom at the Port Authority, and that he believed that closing the lanes may have even been a violation of the law. And for Anthony Hayes, that email served as an exclamation point in a week of creeping realization that there were probably shenanigans afoot. The communications team, right, I think we were eight or ten people. You know, the tunnels, bridges, and terminal, which is the portfolio that we're talking about at the Port Authority, that was not my portfolio. That was another person at the port. But, you know, that person and I worked very closely together and... At one point, he had come in and said, is this possible that this is something? And I'm just like, I can't imagine. I was like, there's just somebody who's angry or, you know, I think we were all just trying to like understand what it was. And as it started becoming more clear, yes, I was involved in various meetings that sort of made it clear there was a lot more than met the eye. And, you know, that was right around the time where I think it's a widely, widely published email at this point. And God bless Pat Foy. The executive director of the Port Authority, appointed by Governor Cuomo. Yes, yes, thank you. God bless Pat Foy. Sorry, I'm being too familiar. But a great guy and sort of sent the email and exactly the kind of email that needed to be sent. And it was exactly the kind of leadership that was needed to really undo what had turned out, again, as we all learned over time, what was really unimaginable. At that point, it was just sort of, I mean, Pat made it very clear in his email to just as soon as is safely possible, get those 
lanes reopened. And then from there, it just became, you know, what it became that everyone watched it become, which, you know, we just sort of had a front row seat at. What it became was, by all accounts, a slow implosion. Local media continued to hound the Port Authority comms team for answers that they didn't have. And this turned out the pressure on these three big players in the New Jersey leadership silo. Bridget Ann Kelly, Governor Christie's Deputy Chief of Staff, Bill Baroni, the Deputy Executive Director of the Port Authority, and David Wildstein, the Director of Interstate Capital Projects, another Christie appointee. These were the three that were indicted as sort of the chief mischief makers behind the Bridgegate scandal. These officials in the weeks that immediately followed it, emails and text messages would later show they tried to orchestrate what I would describe as a fairly ham-handed cover-up where they tried to write the whole thing off as a traffic study. Just from your perspective as a public relations and strategic communicator, how did that go for them? Well, I think there's two things I want to, just to start, I do want to clarify for listeners that, you know, and I don't understand the exact thing, but I know that the U.S. Supreme Court sort of weighed in on this. And so my understanding is, is that Bridget and Bill have been cleared. And so I just want everybody to sort of understand all of those nuances because it did make it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. You were a, a witness. On a witness list. Yes. I think that was very early on. I don't believe so for the Supreme Court, but, you know, obviously contractually, I think any of us who were involved and I was had to be sort of ready to get a call. And so we all were. But so in the days that followed, yeah, it was not I'm not entirely sure how or where the traffic study came from. I can say that certainly at that point, really, things were fairly what's the right word, (laughs) divided in the port and sort of in a way that like, uh, you know, you had that group doing what they were doing. And then I think the rest of us were sort of marching ahead and trying to give colleagues, I think at the time, right, the right due process and benefit of the doubt. But, you know, for them, I think what played out very publicly was, is that not a lot of people believed there was a traffic study. I can't say whether there was or wasn't. I wasn't a part of it. I wasn't a part of a meeting, but I know that generally with traffic studies, you know, you tend to know that they're going on. But, you know, I think everybody really internally was just trying to pick the pieces up. And again, I think really focus on making sure we were being transparent and everybody took it very seriously what had happened, the level of obligation we had to make that clear to legislators and people that were investigating. And it would not have likely been my strategy. But again, you know, maybe somehow the three of them thought there actually was something. Who can say what they were thinking? Certainly, I can tell you personally, the whole thing was pretty disappointing just because, you know, Bill Baroni is a good man and is I still consider him a friend. I certainly don't think Bridget deserved, you know, I think she had an offhanded quip that will live with her probably for the rest of her life over email. But I think most of all, it was disappointing because there were some really good people wrapped up in that and they certainly have paid whatever price needed to be paid. In spite of the traffic study deflection, the story only picked up steam. And in short order, the Wall Street Journal was reporting on it. How did your role in managing the crisis and the public perception of it change and evolve as the story snowballed? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it's important to sort of make sure I I make clear. I was a part of a team of people and it really was a team of communicators. And at the top of the chain was a really wonderful, smart woman named Lisa McSpadden and then a series of other people who really were trying to make the best of and provide the best guidance. And, you know, I think under Lisa's leadership, really, it was a very difficult time as a communicator because it was one where as it continued to grow, not only was it press inquiries, which is one piece of it, but, you know, there were inquiries from governmental bodies wanting to understand what happened and to investigate. 
And so as anybody who does a lot of crisis management knows, anytime there's sort of like legal ramifications involved in communicating, you know, it changes your tools and tactics as a communicator. There's one thing to just sort of manage press inquiries, which, you know, of all the people that I worked with were, were wildly capable, of, either individually or as a collective whole. I think, you know, we had some of the best people that I know, but it got much more complicated. It was less about... I would say over time, and I can't sort of quantify the exact amount of time, but in the probably six to eight months that followed Pat Foy's email, I would say that the change was really about making sure that we were all complying with all of the legal complexity that had introduced itself into all of this as well as needing to do the best that we could to manage all of the just unimaginable amount of media inquiries around it. This was one piece of a very complicated, giant agency that on a good day had bad press. And I say that with love because it's just like when you're engaging with that many millions of people every day, day in, day out, planes, trains, automobiles, buses, every sort of thing you can imagine, and we had all just come out of Superstorm Sandy. Right, right. You thought you had had the worst of it there. Yeah, I mean, we all just sort of lived through that together. And we're still in the midst of trying to get the region turned back on. Our team was just managing so much complexity, and Bridgegate was a piece of it. It's hard to get that across to people because I think they just sort of, anyone assumes that when there's something that's this big of a political crisis that involves, you know, two governors, multiple bodies of people investigating you, subpoenas, et cetera, you know, you assume that's all you do. And it certainly had moments where it felt that way, but we were still doing our job. The day-to-day -day work doesn't go away. No. You know, the chief of police calling saying, you know, we've had an unfortunate incident at the George Washington Bridge, you better get up there. Or, you know, we would have all sorts of challenges with the airports, as one can imagine, where it was constantly just sort of managing those things. And so it was very, very complicated, but it was not. And I think this is the most important thing. And what was so disappointing for all those thousands and thousands of employees at the Port Authority is when you said Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, that's all anybody knows about it, but they don't realize how much incredible work goes on out of that building. Well, let's address that then, because from a PR standpoint, it suffices to say that the reputation of the Port Authority took a hit in the eyes of the public as a result of this scandal, even though it was just three bureaucrats that perpetrated the whole thing. So even though the vast majority of employees at the Port Authority had nothing to do with the scandal public institutions in general take a hit as a result of something like this? How do you go about rebuilding the public trust in the wake of a scandal like this? It's a good question. And I would say a lot of that, this is my opinion. And I think just to be clear with all your listeners, you know, I haven't been at the Port Authority for many, many years. And I think what they have done to change the structure there, I think the way the board and the executive director and team that are working there now, I think they really have removed a lot of those abilities where something like that could happen again. Obviously, nothing's 100%, but I think everybody at the port should be very proud of that. So to your question about how do you sort of try to rebuild the public trust, I think a lot of that happened through just constant ongoing changes and reminding people, you know, we would go out of our way as communicators to work with press to be like, we get it, we get it, Bridgegate. And did you know, you know, for instance, one of the things we did, which is one of my favorite things that I got to do when I was at the Port Authority, every 10 years, the George Washington Bridge gets painted. And so I sort of overheard this in a, in a meeting and I was like, wait, what did you say? And they're like, every 10 years, you know, it's that, it's that time. It's their, the painters are painting the bridge. And I'm like, oh, are they the same painters every time? And they're like, yeah, actually they are. And I'm like, oh my God, we need to take someone up to meet the painters. And you know, it's like a good community story. It's a local business. You know, it's all those things. And I was like, that's a great story. And I turned to Pat Foy and I was like, we need to go up to the George Washington Bridge. And he goes, I agree. And Pat was always game to like highlight all the workers that really worked there and just did so much. And so, you know, we convinced Bob Woodruff and team to go up and we climbed down the big tube with ABC 
And so we're like strapped in and like walking down this thing. And it was really fabulous. I mean, it was really, I mean, what a cool, cool thing to be a part of. So it was those kinds of tools and tactics as a communicator that you have to like, especially something like Bridgegate where it's a sustained crisis, you really have to put it in a box and have a team that's managing that, which, you know, I was certainly a part of that team. But then there was also just a very clear, like, okay, we're only giving this, this amount of time. And now what else are we doing? And what other stories can we tell out of this building? Because there were thousands of stories. I was also very lucky in that, you know, I had the pleasure of introducing the world to the World Trade Center after the attacks. And my time there was a really interesting time because the entire 16 acres had been surrounded by a fence for 10 years. I remember that. Yeah. So we were able to, I was able to sort of be there when we started bringing people onto the site, starting introducing, you know, architects, reporters, and started walking them through like where you saw these designs, now there's hard infrastructure. And it's like, yeah, people will walk through here and then they'll go up here. And like, you could start to see it and feel it. It was really, I mean, at one point, I forget who wrote this, but someone in the news wrote, it's sort of the hottest ticket in town getting behind the fence kind of thing, you know, for New Yorkers. So that was obviously, for the agency, it just meant a, such a great deal. And so many people, thousands and thousands of people obviously worked on that. And so getting to tell their stories and have the construction workers be interviewed to bring the Today Show up on top to go live when we put the final piece of Spire into the One World Trade Center was really just a once in a lifetime kind of thing. But even as Anthony and the comms team at the Port Authority worked to restore trust in the institution, the Bridgegate scandal moved into its next phase. Investigations were launching on a state and federal level, and the results painted a picture of political payback behind the lane closures. And Anthony Hayes was in for a bumpy ride for the remainder of his tenure at the Port Authority. While the rest of us were learning about damning document dumps, he was taking away lessons that would set the stage for the next step in his career. If you don't feel comfortable having the email or text message that you're writing published in the New York Times, don't write it. Plus, what did the governor know and when did he know it? Anthony's candid insights on the fate of Governor Chris Christie's abortive 2016 presidential campaign. That's in a minute here on Light Balloon. You know, we're coming up on 50 episodes of Lead Balloon, and it has been a real treat to get to tell these stories. But podcasting could sometimes be a lot like yelling out into the void. If I don't get any feedback, I don't know if what I'm doing is working for you. Sure, we've won some awards, and I can see that our listenership has grown over the years. But I don't know what you find valuable about this show. I don't know if I should be doing longer or shorter episodes, more or fewer fun topics, serious topics... And so as we're winding down the fourth season of Lead Balloon, I'm looking ahead to next year, and it would be really valuable to me if you could take a quick survey to help me make this show better for you. Two minutes of your time is all I'm asking. Visit podcampmedia.com slash survey, and I'll drop a link to that in the episode description as well. That's podcampmedia.com slash survey. And speed of milestones, hey, here at PodCamp Media, we recently published our 250th branded podcast episode on behalf of clients. If you want to learn more about launching a podcast for your brand, visit PodCampMedia.com. Let's get a meeting on the calendar. This is Lead Balloon, and I'm Dusty Weiss. Anthony Hayes was a spokesman for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey as the infamous Bridgegate scandal of 2013 unfolded. And unfold, it did. In the months that followed, investigations in the New Jersey legislature, an inquiry by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and even a U.S. Senate investigation peeled back the scandal like the layers of an overripe onion. The leading theory is that a group of New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's aides and appointees targeted Fort Lee Mayor Mark Sokolich because the Democrat had declined to endorse the Republican governor in his re-election bid. That's just a theory, but it's clear from the evidence that, whatever the reason, they had it out for this guy, and they took it out on the whole city. 
On August 13th, Christie's Deputy Chief of Staff Bridget Ann Kelly sent an email to Port Authority appointee David Wildstein that read, Time for some traffic problems in Fort Lee. Wildstein then handed down the orders to close the traffic lanes, including the edict that local officials should not be notified in a blatant breach of regular protocol. And in response to messages from Fort Lee's mayor asking them to do something, do anything about his crippling traffic problems, Kelly texted to Wildstein, Is it wrong that I'm smiling? Wildstein replied, No. But then Kelly wrote, I feel badly about the kids, I guess. To which Wildstein responded, They are the children of Buono voters. Referring to Barbara Buono, Christie's Democratic opponent in the most recent election. The digital paper trail goes on like this. Wildstein and Deputy Executive Director Bill Baroni, another Christie appointee, would resign their posts in December, three months after the scandal broke. Governor Christie fired Bridget Ann Kelly a month later, and all three would eventually be prosecuted for conspiracy and fraud. Their convictions, however, would be overturned in 2020 by the Supreme Court on the grounds that the charges couldn't be upheld because there was no actual monetary benefit to them from the scheme. As Justice Elena Kagan wrote, quote, not every corrupt act by state or local officials is a federal crime. And Anthony Hayes was there watching as this all began to play out at the end of 2013. Every time there was a document, um, we would get subpoenas for documents. And so then all of a sudden, all these emails would be given to said body of government that was investigating. And then you don't know as a communicator exactly what's in those because it's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of emails or communications. And so you find out because there's a phone call from the journal or the Times or so you start to understand and you know what someone may have thought was a one off quick email, maybe a snide remark about a colleague just because you were having a bad day is now public consumption. It seems like there's a lesson in this for professional communicators and even public officials all over. If you don't feel comfortable having the email or text message that you're writing published in the New York Times, don't write it. It's so easy to take sort of a quick comment out of context. There were just emails that went around that just weren't necessarily the most flattering. It doesn't mean that there was anything wrong or illegal. It just means you may not have looked like your best self. And we've all done it. I probably still do it, even though I advise every single client basically don't email. But this in particular points a very clear lens at don't email if you're not okay with people reading it. What I've realized from my own experience, having worked in local government for a while myself, is that this leads to very short, very dry emails and very long, very colorful phone calls because a phone call is not a public record. Yes. Well, and also like everything in the phone call can be taken in context. Like even the person you're emailing could get confused, right? And so then because they got confused, all of a sudden what you guys are emailing back and forth about inadvertently could have the appearance of something that could possibly be illegal or just look really bad. And it could just be over a miscommunication over email because you're both just really busy people and not paying attention to what you're writing down. And so... It really is true. I mean, I, I think there are many examples, too. I think that certainly when you even look at what happened on Secretary Clinton's campaign in 2016, there was a bunch of emails that sort of got hacked and released and all of these things. It's, it's just very common in the world that we live in. You know, it may not end up being a Bridgegate scenario, but it is extremely common that emails are grabbed and used. I've noticed that I actually tend to scare people a little bit because they'll send me an email and I'll just grab the phone and call them immediately. Oh, yeah. And they'll be like, I just emailed you. I'm like, I know I wasn't going to email you back. I wanted to talk about this. And that still spooks people. It spooks the naive people. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's been around is like, you know what? You're right. This is a better phone call. I know people are so anti-phone and we text everything now, but it just, especially to young professionals who are of a generation where that's just very commonplace. You just can't understand the impact. It seems like we get another reminder about once a year. As a crisis communication person, I can always count on someone emailing something they shouldn't. 
looking back at the impact of the whole thing, a lot of people had Chris Christie as a frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination in 2016. Instead, in the wake of Bridgegate, his poll numbers plummeted. He wound up dropping out of the race after the New Hampshire primary. How directly linked are those two things, would you say? Yeah, I mean, there's been tons of speculation about it, obviously. It certainly didn't help, right? So, you know, one could also just argue that really nobody was responding to Chris Christie's message in Iowa or New Hampshire. And so that's also just a perfectly fine and logical explanation. But I I think that certainly when you're in having gone in those states a couple of times in presidentials, it is very on the ground. It is very sort of retail politics. And so I am sure Bridgegate impacted those sort of like coffee shop meetings that you see or the ice cream shop where he's popping in to grab a thing or what. I, like, I'm sure people were like, yeah, but didn't you shut down that bridge? I'm sure those things happened, but I don't think it was sort of the nail in the coffin, so to speak. But I think it certainly took him back from where he was in terms of sort of being the front runner. But obviously, as we saw throughout 2016, it was quite different than everyone thought. Right. Yeah. Well, a lot of things got pretty weird in the 2016 presidential election. And that this wound up as a footnote speaks to just exactly how weird 2016 was. Exactly. So you don't work for the Port Authority anymore. So I can ask you one of those questions that when you worked for the Port Authority would have been like an instant, hmm, I don't have a comment on that. But Governor Christie was never indicted in the whole thing. He has always tried to maintain a certain degree of plausible deniability. Yeah. You were there. Do you think he was in on Bridgegate? I would find it hard to believe, given his leadership style, that he wasn't somehow briefed. That was a good answer. In December of that year, Governor Christie announced the resignations of Bill Baroni and David Wildstein. And of course, then things would pick up and go downhill. There were indictments. There were ultimately convictions, which were then overturned by the Supreme Court on some grounds that it's spirit of the law versus letter of the law kind of stuff. And that's for people who are lawyers to debate, not me. (laughs) We're just simple communicators. But you already alluded, you left your position at the Port Authority in the summer of 2014. Did all of this play a factor in that? What prompted your decision to pursue other opportunities? Yeah, of course it played a factor. It was a very difficult place to work, especially in the kind of position that I was in. Our team was very, the the whole communications team, not just me. You know, we were all incredibly, you know, we lived Bridgegate day in and day out. You know, I think a few other departments or what I hope for my colleagues in other departments is that they were able to sort of like be annoyed, but get to their job. We didn't have a lot of that luxury. I think we did well under the circumstances and under Lisa's leadership and certainly Pat's leadership. Yeah, it was definitely a reason that I wanted to leave, which was disappointing because I really, I hated and loved working there even before Bridgegate, just because, you know, as a communicator, it was really a 24 seven job and fascinating and every day was a crisis. And, you know, I maybe should talk to a therapist about it, but I do enjoy that. (laughs) These days, you are a 40 Under 40 award winner in New York. You founded the Hayes Initiative, a boutique LGBTQ owned and operated strategic communications firm. You've given press briefings to former presidents and secretaries of state. How did this experience at the Port Authority prepare you for that? Well, when you are in, and I really can't state it heavily enough that every day at the Port Authority, you know, we would all just look at each other and be like, what did they say just happened at that facility? Like, we couldn't believe all of the things that were just constantly happening. And so you learn sort of how to very quickly know what is important to sort of C-suite level people, right? There's obviously in a briefing, right? It should be pretty exec level, but I just got very good at honing a message. I got very good at understanding sort of like what was the real problem that we were talking about versus the like, you know, maybe the myriad of things that will come after that's easy to sort of get spun up on in a meeting. And you learn to be a lot less, and I don't mean this in a critical way or sort of a negative way or automatron kind of way, but like you just are a lot less emotional about things. I have a very thick skin when it comes to very uncomfortable inquiries from New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you name the major outlet. 
So I think all those things really helped me fine tune how I communicate to whomever I'm reporting to or whomever has hired me to say, what's our big problem here, right? And create a pathway to like, not just point out the problem, but come up with a recommendation in pretty quick order because it was not uncommon at the Port Authority to sort of get something very incredibly complex and detailed from an engineer who, bless them, have just like unimaginable data in their head, but it's a little bit like watching paint dry and no one understands how it applies to their life when they're taking the train. And so I would have to sort of decipher that, you know, within about 10 minutes and be ready to sort of put a statement out. So you get really good at being like, that's not important. People won't care about that. And just, I did learn a lot about, you know, what media will care about and what the public will care about. Because I think it's easy to get into group think to be like, no, but this little widget is so important. And because of the widget, all the magic happens. And I'm like, yes, but the train was delayed. So the widget is broken as far as they're concerned. And they're like, no, it's not. And I'm like, it is. Explain to John Q. Public why he or she should care and will be impacted. And you'll get their attention every time. If you can't do that, it's not a story. Is it closed? Will it affect my commute? Okay, great. I don't care. When we talk about Bridgegate, I have one final gripe, and that is the fact that it's a bad cliche that whenever there's a scandal, it becomes XYZ gate, Bridgegate, Pizzagate, Gamergate. There's a gate for everything now. And I'm always disappointed because this is an allegedly creative field in strategic communications, right? We're creative people, but we still come to rely on these tired old cliches. So If you could wave a magic wand and rebrand Bridgegate as anything better, what would you have it called? Uh, Dumbest thing ever. (laughs) I mean, it's hard for me because like I actually, you know, the genesis of it obviously is Watergate, right? And so as a political person or someone who's been involved in politics, there's something about it that I sort of love. I wish we weren't so free to name everything a gate. Like I wish it had to hit a threshold. Do you know what I mean? Of, of like certain level of scandal. There has to be at least $5 billion worth of economic impact or somebody's political career has to end or something like that. I do agree with your context that it's like, not everything is a gate. I will say that is the big lesson too that I took away was, you know, when I'm with clients who call and they're like, huh, Twitter's going crazy. Have you ever seen anything like it? And I'm just like, what do you mean? And they're like, they're tweeting about the thing. And I'm like, well, who's tweeting? And they're like, hold on, I'll send it to you. Hold on. And they'll text it while we're on the phone and I'll open it up. And I'm like, it's a tweet and he has three followers. And one of the followers is you. So like, (laughs) I think we're okay. This is not a scandal. And so I do think that was one skill set that I did walk away with of like, you can't be in the arena and not expect to get sort of batted around no matter what, whether you're small, medium or big business, you know, you have to be ready to get your licks, so to speak. So don't have to engage with the small fries. Yeah. But also, you know, it's not if, but when everyone will go through crisis, it will happen. Guaranteed. It may not be huge like Bridgegate, but it'll be something to you. And to you as a business owner or CEO, it may feel, you know, like the most critical thing you've ever gone through. I crafted a few of these, some alternate branding for Bridgegate. I wanted to bounce them off you. I want to know what your favorite is here. What do you think about the great traffic cone caper of 2013? It doesn't have dumbest thing ever in front of it, so no. The hullabaloo on the Hudson? Fun. I would take that. I think that one or the bridge and tunnel brouhaha are my two favorites. Right those now. two are strong. I would be fine with both of that. Was, I think I probably would pick number two out of those. Well, if you start using it, everybody else has to follow suit. That's the way that it works. So we'll see how influential I am about that. Hullabaloo on the Hudson. It's decided. <laughs> Anthony Hayes, founder of the Hayes Initiative, a public affairs and strategic communications firm in New York. If somebody wants to learn more about you and what you do, where can we find you? You can go to our website, HayesInitiative.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn, Anthony Hayes. Well, Anthony, thank you for joining us on Lead Balloon. Thank you. It was great. That is going to do it for this episode of Lead Balloon. If you enjoy the show, why don't you pull up your podcast app right now and hit the share button. I know that sometimes unsolicited podcast recommendations will get you exiled to the lonely lunch table. I really hope that we're providing something of value to the PR and marketing community here. And I'd like 
to continue to grow it. So tell a friend if you could, please. Lead Balloon is produced by PodCamp Media, where we provide branded podcast production solutions for businesses. Check out our website, podcampmedia.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Larry Kilgore III handled the dialogue editing on this episode. Special thanks to Jessica Brooks and Ben Colloy for the little bit of podcast road trip voice acting that they contributed. Until the next time, folks, thanks for listening. I'm Dusty Weiss.